You're watching Talim Ahora with me, George Galloway, on Al Maidin Television, coming to you from London. We took the cameras, as I said, out onto the streets of London to interview the public to see what they thought. Watch this. to solve this problem? Well, I think we certainly need to work together to solve the problem. If we have a coordinated approach and a united approach, then surely we'll get more done. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's very important for uh, that all countries can work together and solve this problem together because one country can't help everyone or a few. Well, I think we certainly need to work together to solve the problem. If we have a coordinated approach and a united approach, then surely we'll get more done. Well, definitely, they should come unite and they should make a special law for these refugees. Absolutely, it's a great way to unite them, to share in the responsibility, yes. Well, I think all the European countries need to, to play their own part. The reality is that some European countries are obviously much, much bigger than others and have a better financial infrastructure. Let's uh, carry on with the discussion here in the studio. Yes, madam. Uh, hi, my name is Rana. I want to start by saying that I agree uh, with the gentleman about uh, taking the steps uh, Putin has taken to uh, look for a political solution. And that's what they call, called for since the beginning of uh, the problem in Syria. But I disagree with you by saying that Bashar al-Assad is a dictator. If he was a dictator, the people wouldn't run to, to elect him during this uh, crisis. He had more than 50 percent, so he's, he's not, uh, he, he is uh, elected by, by his own people. And now the people who are fleeing uh, Syria, they, say they wish they were still in, in the same, uh, uh, in, in their country under Bashar al-Assad's uh, ruling because they had everything they wanted to. They had all the, the social uh, services we have here in the UK. They had it in Syria. They didn't own any penny to any country around the world because they, they could have supported themselves all the time. But now the, the uh, European and the, the West and America, they did they did destroy uh, Syria, uh, first of all because uh, Assad is, is supporting uh, the resistance and uh, is uh, destroying the dream of the Zionists to, to do their uh, entity, their illegal entity from, uh, from Iraq to, uh, to Palestine. So uh, the uh, axis or the, you know, the allies between Iran, Syria and uh, Hezbollah as well as the Palestinian resistance, is putting an end to this dream. And inshallah, whatever they do, whatever they do, even if they destroyed Syria, and this is breaking our hearts, even if we're watching uh, comedic shows showing the destruction in Syria, we cry. Because Syria didn't do any harm to anyone, even the Arab people, every refugee, from Iraq, from uh, uh, every, every part of the world, even the Lebanese when we had the war in 2006, they opened their doors to us. They had everyone in, in their country, even you know, the, the Iraqi ones, the Palestinian, they get educated in Syria as, as, as well as the Syrian ones. They are treated like, like their own people. So we, yeah, uh, Syria doesn't want uh, all, all the Western people, uh, Western country, to take the, to take uh, its people uh, as a refugee. As you said, the first step to solve the pro problem is to stop the war, and then they will start to, to rebuild the, their their country. And they need fund to rebuild their country because they don't have it, have any any resources anymore. So everyone should unite to stop the war and stop this, this insane. You said that uh, 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 foreign policy in, in the UK and uh, the West is insane. It is in, insane. And, and they, they, they should realize this. And I think one, one good, uh, one good uh, result came out of this crisis that people started to seeing this uh, stupidity. And that's why they want to change. And that's why Mr. Uh, uh, Jeremy Corbyn was elected as a leader of uh, the Labour, because people want peace, want, don't want any more wars. Thank you. No, thank you. I agree with almost uh, 
all of that, but we mustn't uh, be more Catholic than the Pope. We mustn't be more royal than the king. Bashar al-Assad, if he was here, would not claim to be uh, the leader of a democracy. Uh, many, actually, m many of the social services and other attributes of uh, progressive politics were actually abolished by Bashar al-Assad. They were introduced by his father. And Syria was a socialist country for many years. But Bashar al-Assad pursued neoliberal economic reforms, a privatization, and so on, to please the Western leaders who are now trying to destroy him. So actually, the Syrian system is much less, as you described it, under Bashar than it was under Hafez al-Assad. But under both of them, it is, by anybody's standards, a dictatorship. A dictatorship is where the president runs, nobody runs against him, and he gets 97% of the vote. That's a dictatorship. A dictatorship is where you have, effectively, a one-party state. A dictatorship is where the intelligence, the mukhabarat, are everywhere, listening to everybody. And if you take a different view, you get locked up. And if you get locked up, bad things happen to you. Bashar knows this. And Bashar, I believe, is the man to make the transition. But there needs to be a transition. We mustn't pretend uh, otherwise, at least in my point of view. Yes, let's get back the lady behind you. Let's get back to the refugees before you wrap up this discussion. Um, the neighboring countries, obviously Jordan, Lebanon, are the most vulnerable with Jordan having a lot of uh, lack of resources, especially when it comes to water, and Lebanon already overburdened with its own problems. Now, the other countries are booming economically, the Gulf countries, the UAE, Qatar, with, the 20, with, with all the, the projects that is, that is taken for the World Cup, for every tower that is built in London, Berlin, or, or anywhere in Europe, there are 20 built in the Gulf. And those are a need for Arabic language speakers, for skilled labor, and so on. So why don't they share the burden, the burden of the refugees, instead of Turkey, which is becoming a porous border and supposedly a threat to Europe when it comes to that. While the Arab states control it very well, it seems, with other immigrants, so they might as well take some of their fellow Arabs. What do you think of that? Why does a scorpion sting? A scorpion stings because it's a scorpion. These people made this disaster. These people you mention are the ones who are paying for this disaster. They are the ones who gave the money and the weapons and the propaganda uh, channels to support this uh, destruction of Syria. You think they're now going to say, okay, we'll take uh, a, big, uh, a big influx of Syrian refugees. They are afraid of Arabs. They are afraid of Muslims. Go to these countries. See who the immigrant labor are. Hardly any of them are Arabs. And hardly any of them are Muslim. They're afraid of Arabs and afraid of Muslims because they're afraid of being overthrown in their rotten, corrupt, perverted tyrannies. Don't get me started. Yes, madam. Of course, this gentleman uh, asked some part of my question. My question was that Europe opened its door to refugees. Do you think Europe did it uh, under its legal obligations or under its political benefits or uh, because of a humanitarian or humanity, because we see in pictures or something, uh, it is a little bit ambiguous. And the second part, which you answered, why didn't Arab countries open mm. their doors mm. to refugees? Too the Arab countries are too busy destroying Syria to try and uh, save it. Our friend, uh, our expert, made the point right at the beginning. Everyone has the legitimate right to claim political asylum, but they must claim it in the first safe country in which they arrive. Our friend disagrees. That's my reading of the international law. Yeah, un under, the, under the European Union's interpretation, and now how they apply the rules under the Dublin Convention, and they've set the criteria that it's in the first safe country that you arrive, you must claim asylum. But that's not in the 1951 protocol, which actually had its origins originally from 1926. But in the 1921 protocol, uh, well, the 1921 and uh, the 1967 protocol, uh, it's actually any country you can go and claim, and you have the right to 
if you're going to claim asylum, if you're a genuine, genuine refugee, to cross any borders to get to the country that you wish? Well, here we get into a question of interpretation like the occupied territories or les territoires occupés. Uh, the, my interpretation and the European Union's interpretation is that you must claim asylum in the first safe country that you arrive in. You can go to any country, of course, but you can't go from one safe country to another uh, until you find one that uh, you really wanted to go to in the first place but couldn't uh, reach it. Now, I'm in favour of the suspension of that arrangement anyway. We have to have a fair and just distribution uh, of refugees. Because, theoretically, you could flee Turkey to Greece and say, I'm applying for political asylum in Greece. Everyone, millions upon millions upon millions, could all claim political asylum in Greece. That's not fair to Greece. Greece is already in a state of semi-economic uh, collapse. I repeat again, for the avoidance of doubt, I'm against the refugees coming here at all. Not because I'm... Uh, a hater of refugees, but because I believe, someone put it, that we're actually doing ISIS's work for them by helping empty uh, these countries uh, of refugees and picking and choosing where we can the, the, the best qualified and most economically active ones that we can. Yes, sir, at the back. <coughs> Thank you. I'd like to ask the gentleman at the front, would you ever wish to seek refuge in the home of a man who has destroyed yours? Saudi Arabia is not the solution. Saudi Arabia can never be the solution. Let us stop selling ourselves dreams and thinking that the salvation for Syria can ever come from Saudi Arabia or from Europe. They are the destroyers. They are not the people attempting to rescue us. So no, I would disagree with any narrative which begins to conclude or to even assume that uh, that Europe or, or, or the instigators of this violence in Syria can ever begin to bring about any sort of uh, rescue for the country. The Syrian population does not need the Saudi Arabians, it doesn't need the Europeans, it doesn't need the Americans. What we need is for a continuation of the Syrian Arab Republic to, to continue to be sovereign and independent as it always, as it always has been as it, and as it will continue to be. But I'm just, you know, I'm just, I'm very pessimistic about this, uh, this viewpoint that Saudi Arabia or Turkey or Europe can ever bring about a solution to the crisis as has been discussed. Well, uh, of course, the foreign interference, invasion and now occupation of Syria should never have happened. But as it has happened, we're going to need an international solution to it. And President Putin is the only uh, major uh, superpower uh, that can, I think, help to bring it about. I think that Putin's idea of a return to the Geneva track is the only solution here. There's no return to the status quo ante. Half of the country is in the hands of uh, foreigners. And, uh, and of course, some Syrian uh, fighters, uh, but most of these fighters are Chechens and Libyans and uh, Tunisians and uh, British and uh, Scottish, Welsh, uh, French, Dutch, Belgian, Takfiris. Uh, God knows what the Syrian people think of it all. Uh, Syria, for those who don't know it, was a highly sophisticated, developed society a place where the idea that women should not work or the idea that you can't sit with your wife in a restaurant, she's got to sit somewhere uh, else, the idea that you should destroy, not cherish and protect, but destroy the holy places of others is simply as far from the mindset of the vast majority of Syrians as it is possible to imagine. Well, be before you finish, can I interrupt you? Yes, does, does that mean you can have the last word, go on. Does, well, the lady there as well. Does that mean Iran is backwards when it comes to gender segregation and women's rights on that notion? Actually, women have a very strong position in Iran. I go to uh, press TV in Tehran and women are running it. Uh, women are driving, women are present everywhere in the public sphere. You have a skewed, as skewed, an idea of Iranian society as you appear to do about Saudi Arabian society and their ability to 
help this uh, process. Unfortunately, I've run out of time. But you forgot uh, Yemen. I did forget Yemen, but I can't deal with everything in one show. I'll have to deal with Yemen another time. It's been marvelous. Thanks very much for joining me. <laughs>